Well, good morning, friends. Let me uh, bid you a word of welcome to this service as we hold it in rather peculiar and unusual circumstances. Uh, Normally, whenever a church service is streamed, there's a congregation and there's maybe a sweep of cameras. You can see other people and what's going on. Unfortunately, we can't do that today. I'm flying solo. Uh, So you're going to have to look at me. Uh, Somebody made the remark that I've got a, a good face for radio. I don't know what that's going to be like over the internet, so I'm going to leave that with you. Uh, But it's good to have you here. And don't worry, uh, there's a rumour circulating that I'm going to be singing a solo. I'm going to be singing Majesty on my own. Uh, I only sing Majesty, Worship Your Majesty uh, as a duet, as some of you will know. But it's good to have you here this morning, and it's good to uh, honour God by way of his word and by way of his worship. And I trust that God will bless and encourage both you and I as we seek to um, know something of his goodness and grace to our souls. I'm going to give some announcements first of all and then we'll uh, work our way through a number of things centering our worship on the word of God, of course. But by way of announcements, uh, there's a prayer meeting, believe it or not, on Thursday evening at 8. Now we're not gathering here as is our normal custom, but we're gathering over the internet on an internet site that's called Zoom. Uh, We had a tester on Thursday evening pass and it went quite well. A number of teething problems, but it was really good. And if you want to know more details about that, uh, can I ask you to contact Philip Kelly. And uh, Philip will hopefully give you a few pointers if you want to join into that. And I encourage you to do so. We still need to pray. And uh, we're having a wedding here on Friday. Uh, David Spears and Abigail Jones have just noticed that I've written David Spears versus Abigail Jones. Uh, trust that will not be the case. But uh, <clears throat> I want to pray for this couple. They've had to rearrange things, of course, in light of the situation. But we ask God to bless that day and to bless them every day uh, beyond that day too. We've also set up a, a Dromore Baptist Church Facebook page. And so if you go onto the search and put Dromore Baptist Church in, I'm sure that you'll be able to work your way onto that. And that is for information purposes and hopefully for our encouragement as well. And uh, also I just want to personally say uh, as pastor, if you need my help, um, you just need somebody to talk to, to run things off, uh, don't hesitate to ring me. Um, I can't do my visitation uh, as I uh, would want to do it, uh, you'll appreciate that. So please ring me on 28 92 And so those are a number of announcements that I want to leave with you. And I've no need to tell you that we live in uncertain days that fear is abounding within our society at present. And that's why I want to read a well-known psalm to you. It's a wonderful, wonderful psalm, perhaps the best known of all of the psalms. It's often seen as a psalm for the dead and dying, and hence it's uh, regular use at funeral services. And that's okay, it's very appropriate for that. But it's also a psalm for the live and living, and it's especially for the live and living. And I am, of course, speaking about the wonderful Psalm 23. And this is what it says. No let your familiarity with its words rob you of the the power and presence of God within them. Uh, Because this is a very, very vital word for us in these days. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beautiful, powerful, wonderful. If we know Christ as our Savior, then we can truly say, the Lord is my shepherd. He's ever with us, even if we can't see him, if we can't sense him, he's yet there as we struggle to get by, as we struggle to make sense of things. This lovely little poem that I'm about to read speaks as to that fact that he cares for us, that he takes care of us even if we fail to realize that he's there. And it's called Footprints, and some of you will know it. 
One night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. In each scene I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times there was one set of footprints. This bothered me because I noticed that during the low periods of my life, when I was suffering from anguish, sorrow, defeat or fear, I could see only one set of footprints. So I said to the Lord, You promised me, Lord, that if I followed you, you would walk with me always. But I have noticed that during the most trying periods of my life, there have only been one set of footprints in the sand. Why, when I needed you most, why have you not been there for me? The Lord replied, My child, I have always been there for you. I am the Lord your shepherd. The times when you have seen only one set of footprints in the sand, that's when I was carrying you. Isaiah 41 and 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you're the God who is ever near to us. We praise you for your blessed presence and for the power therein. And we just ask you, Father, to make us conscious of that. And even when the devil tempts us to doubt you, that, Father, our faith would override those lies. We call out to you for our community and we ask, Father, for our church within our community. We pray for the elderly, for those who are housebound, for those who are in homes. We remember those with underlying health issues and who are vulnerable to this virus, that you would protect them. We are very, very conscious of our frontliners, of those who are seeking to help to fight against this disease. Bless them and aid them, keep them fresh and vigorous, Lord, and especially those who are your children and those from this assembly. May they know your strengthening and keeping power, that as their days are, so too shall their strength be. We remember the leaders of our nation. We pray for them. We ask you, Lord, to minister to them. And we pray for our nation itself and for our people, which has lost sight of you, God. We ask that even via this crisis, that, Father, the fear of the Lord would return to the hearts of men and women, and that you would bring blessing out of this burden. So we commend these matters to you. And, Father, we bow before your sovereign and goodwill. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I want us to turn to the word of God. I hope that you have a, <coughs> excuse me, a Bible with you. And that uh, you'll read along as we work through a particular passage from the word of God. And that passage is to be found in the book of Acts. In the New Testament, and Acts is a wonderful book. I preached through it many, many years ago. It's really the story of the early church in its infancy and how the gospel spread from Jerusalem, from 120 believers after Christ rose from the dead in Jerusalem, uh, out into Judea and then to Samaria and then into the uttermost parts of the earth. And there's many wonderful conversion stories within its pages and we're going to look at one such conversion story that's to be found in Acts chapter 16. And if you'll read with me, I'm going to read from uh, verse 25. Don't be afraid to read out loud as I read out loud here. Don't worry, nobody else can hear you or any such thing. So you just read out loud and uh, as well if you want to do that there, of course. But Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison. Awaking from sleep. And seeing the prison doors open. Supposing the prisoners had fled. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying. Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, 
Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. We thank the Lord for his inspired and inerrant work and we know that God has said that it will not return unto him void. I'm given to understand that the Chinese alphabet has something like two and a half thousand letters within it I don't quite know how uh, that fits with their computer keyboards and the like. And I'm very thankful that our alphabet only has the 26. Uh, But I'm reliably informed that there's a Chinese word that's made up of of two of those letters or two of those characters that really conveys a very special and a very significant truth for we who are believers at this uh, critical time in history. And that's the Chinese word, and you can see it in the front of the lectern, I trust. It's the Chinese word for crises, which consists of the characters for danger and opportunity. And in thinking about that, at this time of crises, as the coronavirus sweeps across the world and has descended upon us, as indeed we have to say that it truly is a time of danger, medically and socially and economically, but with that danger there also comes opportunity. And as Christians, it's very important that we realize and that we embrace the fact that to borrow from the words of Mordecai in the book of Esther in the Old Testament, God has us here for such a time as this. God has us personally here for such a time as this, that amidst this crisis and the dangers therein, we might have the opportunity to speak we might have the opportunity to share of the wonderful hope of Jesus. As others are perishing, as others will perish for eternity without the great hope that is ours in him. And surely in God's good plan for this bad thing that has come upon us, as so many are so fretful and fearful and instability and uncertainty abounds, He would have we who are his people to share his light, his truth, his comfort, his hope with those around and about us. Crises equals danger plus opportunity. This is something that comes across loud and clear in this passage that I've read to you from Acts chapter 16. As Paul the Apostle and Silas find themselves in a place of danger, which gives them a wonderful opportunity to serve and to to share the gospel, the good news that there's both earthly and eternal hope to be found in Jesus. And God blesses their faithfulness. And God brings hope to a man who had lost all hope and who was on the very verge of suicide. Now many of you will probably know the backdrop to the story. Paul and Silas had been preaching about Jesus in the city of Philippi, and Philippi was a Roman colony. And God has moved through their efforts, and God has been pleased to save people. Lydia, a rich woman, has given her life to Jesus, as have a number of others. But as he continued to proclaim Christ, there's a slave girl who's a fortune teller, and she begins to follow them around the place, disrupting their ministry and uh, disrupting their messages. And Paul, realizing that she has a dark spirit within her, Paul commands this spirit to leave her in the name of Jesus. And she is exorcised of this evil spirit. Verse 18 tells us that. And her masters are livid. Her masters are enraged about it. For she's been a a cash cow for them. And Paul and Silas have ruined her ability to read other people's fortunes. And now she earns them absolutely nothing. And so in their anger, they lie about these men, accusing them of being disobedient and of being disloyal to Rome. And that was a very serious crime indeed. So they're arrested, they're beaten, they're whipped, they're imprisoned, and their feet are are put in stocks. Not socks, stocks, 
like the ones that we have down in the square in, in Dromore. No friends, there's often a, a very heavy price to be paid for being fearful, faithful to God and the gospel. The scriptures tell us that in no uncertainty whenever they say that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Not might or probably will, but shall suffer persecution. You see, the world does not want God's word, even though the world needs God's word. And it despises we who seek to share it. But share it we should. For those within the world who will hear it and who will heed it, and we're to be God's agents for them to that end. And albeit there can be a great cost in sharing the gospel, there's a much greater cost if we don't, as there's a lost eternity. There's a literal hell ahead for any and all who die in their sin without Jesus. Paul and Silas were faithful to their calling. May we be faithful to ours. But look at where their faithfulness has landed them, as they're in this crisis situation. But remember, crisis equals danger plus opportunity. And as they're in this difficult and dangerous place, a Roman dungeon, facing trumped up charges that could demand a death sentence upon them, as treason meant execution under the laws of Rome, amidst the danger of this crisis, there's opportunity. And we can see how that Paul and Silas laid hold of that opportunity from this passage before us, where we see a number of things. First of all, we can see that they're singing. They're singing. Look at your Bible, verse 25. It says, But at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. What a wonderful witness for the gospel. There they are, beaten and bloodied with their feet in stocks, languishing in a dark, dirty dungeon, with the shadow of a noose or the shadow of an axe or whatever hanging over them. And they're yet singing and praying and praising God. What a tremendous witness. Martin Luther, the great reformer, once said that Satan hates a singing Christian. And this is why. For when we are able to sing out God's praises in the midst of adversity and affliction, it's a powerful, powerful testimony to the glory of God as others, as with these prisoners, are looking on and listening in. And surely that's a, a reason as to why God so often lets his people pass through seasons of adversity and affliction as such serves as a pulpit, as a platform for the gospel as we yet honour him and sing his praises for all to see. You know, it's said that the jewellers and the like will often set their gems and their jewellery on a dark cloth to serve as a backdrop as such really highlights and accentuates the value and beauty of the object as folk gaze upon. And God can do that with his people. He can put our lives against the, the, the backdrop of some dark providence or other, some great difficulty, some distressing uh, season in order to highlight our faith to others as we yet honour and, and praise God, whatever our circumstances. And so you be mindful of that, my friend, if life has been hard and harsh and difficult for you over the last while. And be mindful that others are looking on, that others are listening in. And you determine to praise the Lord and to pray and to sing uh, along with Paul and Silas as those other prisoners watched and wondered at them. And as our society panics in the face of this great crisis that it finds itself in, we have the opportunity to sing God's praises too. But then aside from singing, we also see shaking here too. Verse 26 <coughs> tells us that as they were singing, read it with me, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Somebody once said that when I pray, coincidences happen. And as Paul and Silas are praying and are singing to God, by divine coincidence, there's this earthquake. 
It's a great earthquake. That's what the Bible says. This was well up the Richter scale. And the prison doors and the prisoners' chains break open as the power of the Lord is unleashed for all to see. And in the hidden higher plan of God, and God always has a hidden and higher plan in the subtext of such things, as the world is shaken on the outside, the warder who's at the heart of this passage is shaken on the inside. The jailer who's in charge of the prisoners is beset with an inner turmoil. Verse 27 tells us that. Look at verse 27. And the keeper of the prison awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Now let me tell you friends that a Roman jailer was a tough man. A tough man who had a tough job. And one of the conditions of that job was that if a prisoner escaped under his charge, well then he was given that prisoner's sentence. And that is why this man reacted so very dramatically whenever he saw those doors open and he thought that those prisoners were gone. And who knows what, what crimes and sentences his prisoners had and he would have killed himself suicide was his way out but I want to tell you that suicide is never a way out and don't you ever think that it is if the devil comes a whisper and such lies into your ear you need to look to the Lord and listen to him and to seek his comfort, his help and his hope this man was about to take his own life but Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we're all here. And then he called for a light, ran in, fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. The prisoners were still there. And the jailer, who had been a hair's breadth from killing himself and going to a lost eternity, this jailer stood before them and he trembled, it says, as he was shaken to the very core of his being. And then he asked the apostles the king of all questions, the most vital question that anyone can ever ask in the journey of life. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, friends, sometimes God has to put people in that place of crises and bring an earthquake to bear upon them in order to shake them out of their sinful slumber and in order to wake them up as to their need to ask this very same question. It can be an earthquake by way of an illness. It can be an earthquake by way of an accident. Perhaps an earthquake by way of some other traumatic event or some sort of a close call, some hardship, some, some hurt, some trouble. And in his higher schemes... God wants to bring a blessing through that burden. He wants you to hear him. He wants to have people to ask this same question. How do I get saved? How do I get this sorted out? How do I get right with God? How can I secure hope for my soul? How can I know peace and purpose for my life? And who knows, but maybe... You're an unconverted person listening in today. And perhaps God has been trying to speak to you through some earthquake, some crisis or other. Maybe he's trying to speak to you through the coronavirus situation and all the fear that's emanating from that. And he's calling out to you and he's reaching out to you and he's seeking that you will call back out to him and seek him and ask Okay, God, what must I do to be saved? For I now know that I am lost and I am without hope. Are you lost and without hope? Is that where you're at? This is where the Philippian jailer was. And this is why God brought this earthquake upon him. As he stood there shaking before the apostles and asked this question that night, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the apostles, well, they answered it. This takes us to our third thing. For as we read of singing and shaking, we also read of sharing. Verses 31 and 32. 
So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. What must I do to be saved, the jailer asked. Well, you can't do anything to be saved, came the reply. All you can do is to believe in what Jesus has already done on that cross at Mount Calvary. Your good works won't save you. Your religion won't save you. Nor will your decency or respectability or morality. But belief in Christ will. As you surrender yourself in entirety. In your sin to him. Inviting him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. Repenting of your sin. And receiving him as master of all. Paul and Silas shared this gospel truth. With that jailer and with that jailer's family. And they believed it. And when they believed it they were saved. They were gloriously saved. As these men shared with them. And were ready to do so. In this time of crises. That brought danger. But with that also gave opportunity. And friends at this time of crises. That we're in at present. As as with the jailer, people are beside themselves, people are trembling, people are seeking hope and security and uh, and comfort. We too, we who are the Lord's people, we too must be ready to share the only true hope and security and comfort that there is in this old world of ours and which is found in believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved. So are you ready to share this truth? 1 Peter 3.15 says, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. Are you ready? We need to share our hope by praising God as did Paul and Silas in the midst of their difficulties. That others (coughs) would see our hope And by proclaiming the gospel, as did Paul and Silas, when opportunity arose, that others might know our hope. Let's be found faithful. Let's share the hope of Christ at this time, as people need hope given this crisis that's upon them. Let's take God's word to heart. May God bless you. May he refresh you in your own walk with him. And may he use you in your witness for the gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, we thank you for the opportunity just to honour your word and honour you in the place of worship this morning. We pray, Father, that you'll bless the message, that you'll take it into our hearts and take it into the hearts of others who don't yet know Christ, that through this crisis they might see their need of him, and, Father, that they might call out for that so great salvation and know the hope and the security and the peace that that brings. So hear us now, Father, as we offer this prayer and as we offer with this prayer our praise and bless and glorify your name for Christ's sake. Amen.